Father, we bless you and we thank you that you have spoken. In many times, in many ways. But in these last days, you've spoken to us through your very Son. And you have revealed the fullness of who you are. May these words, may this message, may all our scripture readings and songs tonight draw us more deeply into the fullness of who you are and what you have for us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Christmas is our most sentimental holiday, right? It comes with carefully curated nostalgia, uh, a sanitized set of memories and these warm syrupy feelings, right? Old music, old TV specials, old traditions from from simpler times um, that we wouldn't pay any attention to and probably make fun of at other parts of the year. They find their home in this season. Family is king. Kids are at the center. The, the kids love to act out the story. The nativity love to count down days till the presents love the clamor of the wrapping paper flying everywhere. It's not the kind of season when we wait with expectancy to hear stories about the time the dragon tried to devour the baby who would be king. But maybe it should be. None of our traditions are bad, I think, as far as they go. It's just that they don't go all that far. Sentimentality is light stripped of the shadow. It's the sugary sweet without those pesky, bitter undertones. It's this glittering facade that doesn't go all the way down. And left by itself, it is a false gospel. Because it has nothing to say to the shadows. Sentimentality is powerless in the face of death, in the face of divorces, in the face of leavings and losses. It has nothing to offer to the modern town of Bethlehem in the West Bank, whose Christians are forgoing the public celebration of Christmas this year to lament the war in Israel and Gaza. Sentimentality has the power to see that there's good underneath all this mess, but it cannot transform or conquer the evil and brokenness that covers it over. And that is what we actually need. Because this world is in the midst of a battle. We are all caught up in it. All of us are fighting that battle in some way along some front. Some of those battles are very private. And some are very public. Some are very sudden and new, and some of them have been going for a long time. But even and especially Christmas speaks to us in the midst of those battles. Because Christmas itself can be seen as a battle, as the turning point, the turning point in the war that has engulfed us all. The war that goes all the way back to Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, we learn where this war began. Our first parents were were placed in a glorious world by a good God who loved them and made them to have a relationship with him. But in that abundance, there was already a deceiver waiting, a creature symbolized as a snake who stood against God and wanted to destroy his creatures, destroy us. That deceiver coaxed our parents to turn away from the one who made us, to become rebels against our rightful king and join the other side. And we, in their lineage, continue to make the same decision ourselves. And the cost of that war has been high. Every literal battle, every literal war, but also every heartache, every wound ever since. Disease, despair, anger, bitterness, condemnation, shame, uh, injustice, oppression. But all those problems go back to one source. When we rejected the source of life, we became enslaved to an enemy. 
Scripture says there is a power at work in this world, a power that was unleashed by the serpent and was perpetuated by our rebellion. It goes by many names, sin, death, evil, uh, oppression are just some, but it is a power that has us in its grip. In fact, the scriptures say that still, even now, that same deceiver is the prince of this world, the ruler of this age. That evil power holds sway over creation as we know it and continues to deceive us, continues to wound us, and so we labor, we groan. Who among us has not groaned? Under the weight of the death and the destruction that it's wrought. But all the while, we still have this faint memory of what once was, of what could be again. We're haunted by joy and peace and hope and love and life as it was meant to be life to the full. That's why sentimentality speaks so so deeply to us. It's a glimpse of the goodness that has been covered over by millennia of heartache but we're trapped behind enemy lines and we can't escape, not on our own. Many of us know that helpless feeling even if we've we've buried it deep, it's, it's there. But God is not helpless. God is not powerless and God is a fighter. And while you might expect that God would begin fighting against us since we rejected him and sided with the enemy, he is not that kind of God. The Father, Son, and Spirit, before time even began, began formulating a rescue plan, a plan to fight for us. And in Genesis 4 and onwards, God begins fighting to release us from our bondage and slavery, begins fighting to bring us into that life we were always meant to have begins breaking into history to make a new creation, a new people out of the old one. And as he's working, as he's giving these glimpses of what's to come, he gives promises. Promises that he will do battle with the serpent. Promises that one day a new king will come to lead us out of slavery and back to life as it was meant to be. It was into those promises that Mary and Joseph, as faithful Jews, were born and raised. It was those promises that were ringing in their ears when the angels spoke to Mary, when Joseph had his vision. It was those promises that they clung to when they first got word that in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, those words sound like administrative details to us, government bureaucracy. But to them, they were words of bondage. Because in Mary and Joseph's day, a pretender was on the throne, not the one true king. There's an inscription from the Roman era, from this area that that still uh, survives today, that that reads that Augustus' birth signaled the beginning of good news, beginning of the gospel for the world. In another inscription, it's claimed that his father was the god, Zeus, that he was the savior of the common folk, that he made peace for land and sea, that because of Augustus, there were fond hopes for the future and goodwill, which fills all men, so that they ought to make pleasing sacrifices and sing hymns of praise. Does that sound familiar? In other words, Augustus claimed to be a son of God, worthy of worship, a savior, maker of peace and goodwill, whose birth was good news for everyone. But it wasn't. Just as anyone who promises things like that and is not the one true God, isn't. That birth was bad news for any number of the subjected people under Augustus' thumb, including the Jews. Right? This passage talks about a census, right? Censuses were taken for two reasons in the Roman Empire, for military conscription and for taxes. This counting was an act of oppression. It was part of Rome's oppression uh, of Israel, a subjugated people, and a sign of the deeper oppression under evil and death 
which we all face. But into that world, into that mess, into that darkness, into that injustice, into all that is not right, divine messengers brought a different message. Do not be afraid, they said to the shepherd. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. Then a choir joins and says, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now in our ears, that sounds like something pretty splashed across a Christmas card. In their ears, It was a war cry. In their ears, it was a revolutionary call because that birthday announcement was meant, was designed to push back against Augustus' inscriptions. The angels were declaring nothing less than the real gospel, the real savior, the real Lord, the real joy, the real peace was now here. And if that real king was here, all the pretenders were going to be exposed. Caesar, absolutely. Those who followed this Messiah would have no reason to ultimately fear him because all he could do was kill the body. But even more so, even more deeply, what was to be conquered would be the power behind all oppressive thrones, the power behind all that destroys the powers of sin and death and hell that enslaved humanity since the fall. Friends, Jesus' birth announcement was a subversive message that a coup was underway. That the revolution was taking root right under the enemy's nose. That the true king was being planted behind the enemy lines. That humanity's deepest enslavement was coming to an end now. That's why this night can justly be called the Battle of Christmas, D-Day of the Kingdom of God. As John tells us in his gospel, this was no mere human king invading. God himself was coming in human flesh. The divine Son of God was taking on a human nature. To say it in poetry, because I think we need poetry for, for a night like this, a beachhead of heaven was being established on earth. An anchor of divinity was being set in humanity. God was being united to humanity so that humanity might be reunited with God and rescued from the enemy. Which, of course, the evil one was not too fond of. And that's where Revelation 12 comes in. The Apostle John, as as he wrote this book of Revelation, was writing to Christians who were in the midst of a particular battle. They were being slaughtered under persecution by the Roman Empire. He he wasn't writing obscure prophecies for people to guess which politician is what character 2,000 years later. That's ridiculousness. When you see that kind of stuff, just ignore it. He was writing in symbols that his readers would have readily understood because they, like us, needed hope. They needed to know that this world that we can see is not all there is, needed the news headlines not to be the end of the story. They needed a fresh imagination for how heaven was invading earth. And in this book, that's just the imagination that they're given. In Revelation 12, a woman is crying out in birth pangs. She is reminiscent of of, of Mary, of course, but she most fully represents all of God's people who for thousands of years were pregnant with expectancy, awaiting the birth of God's chosen king. Now, alongside this woman, John also sees a great and terrible dragon. Yes, Christmas is a dragon story. It's the serpent of Genesis, now full-grown. That original deceit which was whispered in Eve's ear over the intervening years has become this horrific terror spewing death and hell and all manner of evils. And this dragon, John says, stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour the child the moment he was born. He's standing there waiting to catch the baby. 
It's not just Caesar who has something to lose here. It was evil itself, death itself, that was rocked by Jesus' entrance and, and stationed itself ready to pounce. And, and, and all throughout the stories uh, and the Gospels, we see this evil. We see it in Herod, who tries to kill uh, the child Jesus early on and ends up slaughtering all his playmates. We see it in the evil one who tries to tempt him in the desert wilderness. We see it in the religious leaders who are like the good guys who try to kill him later on in his life. And we see it in Pontius Pilate and the government authorities who are too cowardly to do justice at the moment of truth. We see this reality in each and every situation where all is not as it should be. We see this in all the places in our lives where it seems like, oh, we're on the cusp of victory, but we, we snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Things fall apart. There is true evil in this world, friends. Behind and under all of these individual evils, and it wants to swallow up the good. But listen to what John says. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was not caught by the dragon, but was snatched up to God and to his throne. Now you're thinking, like, what, what's going on here? Like, I uh, know a little bit about this story. Baby Jesus wasn't just, like, snatched up. But John's got the full story in view, right? After Jesus is born, each time evil and brokenness threaten, God proves more powerful. The king comes through victorious. Time and again, death and hell are no match for him. And the cross, uh, ultimately in the grave that could not hold him. And then finally, this king, this resurrected king, is, is taken back up where? Into the heavenly places. In his resurrection and ascension to rule and to reign, he is snatched back up to God and his throne, still as man, still as human, still as the Son of God in human flesh. Friends, right now, right now, Jesus is reigning in the resurrected human body that was placed in that manger. Right now, he is ruling with justice and with mercy. Right now, he is fighting sin and death and hell with the authority and power and strength of God himself. Right now, he is fighting with you and for you against all that seeks to kill and steal and destroy you and those you love and those you've never met but grieve just the same. And right now, we who trust in him are being kept safe. Revelation 12 says that when the dragon saw he had been defeated, he pursues the woman who had given birth. He pursues the people of God. He chased them down, and he's still chasing us down. But verse 14, the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time. Until, of course, that time when Jesus returns at the end. See, as Revelation 12 ends, Jesus is alive and well and hidden in the heavenly places. And the people of God are alive and well and hidden in the wilderness. Kept safe, but not yet revealed in victorious glory. Secure, but not feeling very triumphant. I find a lot of honesty in that. The Bible isn't trying to hide how it feels to live on, on, on this side of D-Day. If you are in this room tonight and you doubt, because like I just can't see this, doubt makes some amount of sense in this part of the story. If you're in the room tonight and you find yourself just wrestling with fear, yeah, it's still scary out there. Things don't always go the way we think they should. There's still territory held by the evil one. 
And we cannot see the final ultimate victory that is coming. But friends, tonight in this space, in this service, we aren't inviting you into a celebration of Christmas that helps us escape from that world. We don't want you to come in here and just push out of your mind whatever battle that you are facing. We want you to name it. We want you to speak it. We want you to stare it in the face and to speak back to it, I am not alone in this. Because there is one who has come into our world, into our mess, into our battles, there is one who is fighting for you in the midst of it. The Son of God who made all this is remaking all this. And he came right into your mess, into your flesh, into your darkness to break through the enemy lines and to take back territory, to take all that was wrong and broken and to start making it right. Now, one day he's going to come back to the barrier between heaven and earth, and that victory will be revealed for all to see. That day will come. But until then, we celebrate D Day. We celebrate the night that heaven invaded earth. And in that celebration, we refuse to give in to the idea that evil and death will have the final say. We refuse to relent and say this captivity to, to, to injustice, this captivity to, to chaos, this captivity to all things falling apart, we refuse to say that that is our destiny. Even if that victory currently feels hidden, it is more real than we can yet see. So in the remainder of this service, we're going to come to the table, refusing to accept that this emptiness we feel is the way it's going to be. We hold candles high, refusing to admit, to say, refusing to say, refusing to give in to the idea that the darkness will conquer. We shout out, hallelujah, because we know that our liberation is coming. This night, what we celebrate on this night, this battle of Christmas was the decisive moment. It was the turning point in the war. And now nothing is going to stop that victory from coming. May we rest. May we even revel in that hope this night. And if we cannot yet grasp it, may we at least be grasped by it. Let's pray. Father, in these in these scriptures and in these songs and in these words, in these candles and these lights, in this darkness, we're we're trying to reflect something of what you've told us. that in the midst of our darkness, you are coming for us. That you came and that you are coming again. Jesus, we, we would be caught up in that invasion. We would be territory that you take for yourself. in the places where we struggle to believe, in the places where it seems easier to doubt. Capture our hearts. Free us to love and joy and wonder in your glorious goodness and what you're doing on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name, the one we celebrate this night, that we pray these things. Amen.